For our final topic in this course, we're going to discuss separations. In analytical chemistry, a chemical separation is the physical separation of analytes from each other so that we can complete individual analysis. Common techniques for separation include things like distillation or electrophoresis, both of which you might already be familiar with, but could also include extraction and chromatography. We're going to talk about extraction and chromatography in this subject area. Extraction is a technique used to isolate and analyte in only one phase, which for shorthand will give this symbol phi12. When that analyte exists in either another phase, phi2, or when it's partitioned between two phases, phase one and phase two. A typical means of extraction is liquid-liquid extraction. Suppose that you've got a solute in water that you'd like to analyze. But in order to perform your analysis, you need to move that analyte into toluene instead. So we've got a beaker full of water with our analyte dissolved, phase one. And we really need that analyte in toluene if we want to analyze that anulin. So perhaps our approach is going to be to add some toluene to our water solution, shake it, and then siphon off the toluene that separates out with now presumably some of our solute in it. So perhaps we have a beaker that's originally got some water with analyte. So this is phase one. And atop that we've got some toluene that, after mixing, has a little bit more analyte in it. So we'll define those analytes, or solutes, as S1 being the fraction of solute that exists in water and S2 being the fraction of analyte that exists in toluene. After we've mixed, we expect an equilibrium to develop between the fraction of solute that's in phase one, water, and the fraction of solute that's in phase two, toluene. The equilibrium constant for this separation of solute into two different phases is concentration of S2 over concentration of S1. The concentration of our solute in toluene relative to the concentration of our solute in water. Relevant to this equilibrium are a series of parameters, namely the volume of our liquids, water and toluene, and the total amount of solute. We'll call V1 the total volume of water, V2 the volume of toluene, M the total number of moles of solute, and then we'll think about the fraction of that solute that's in the water phase. Maybe we'll call that Q. It stands to reason then that 100% of this solute is in either water or toluene, so 1 minus Q must be the fraction of solute that's in toluene. We can come up with a few relationships then. The concentration of our solute in water, S1, is the fraction of our solute that's in water multiplied by the total number of moles of our solute, M, divided by the total volume of water. The concentration of our solute in toluene, S2, is 1 minus our fraction of solute in water, multiplied by our total number of moles of solute, and divided by the volume of toluene, V2. Thus, if our equilibrium constant were the concentration of solute in toluene, divided by the concentration of solute in water, then this simplifies to 1 minus Q times M, divided by V2, all over Q times M, divided by V1.
if we rearrange this equation, we're going to multiply both sides by q, analyze for just q, we eventually get to the point where q is equal to v1, the volume of our water phase, divided by v1 plus k, our equilibrium constant, times v2, the volume of our toluene phase. By solving for Q here, we have come up with a way to measure the fraction of solute that remains in water. And it's only dependent upon the volume of water that we've got, the volume of toluene that we added to that water, and the equilibrium constant for the separation, how preferable it is for our solute to be in toluene versus in water. Q is dependent on volumes of our phases and the equilibrium constant for our separation. This equilibrium constant is a particularly relevant environmental equilibrium constant. It relates how quickly a particular solute will leach out of water and into another phase. So just by adding one aliqua of toluene of a particular volume, mixing it up with water, and then letting everything settle out and come to equilibrium, we have extracted some fraction of our solute, our analyte, from water. And we can quantify that. And this is true for one set of extraction. So for one extraction, we calculate the fraction of solute that's moved to a new phase, or has remained in our water phase. And we've had one, yes, but what if we went for a second extraction? In other words, we siphon off all the toluene, and then we add a new fresh batch of toluene to our water with now just a fraction of solute in it compared to what it originally had. In the case where we do this extraction twice, we expect to get a proportionately larger amount, Q squared, fractioned away from our water. That would be equal to V1 over V1 plus equilibrium constant times V2 quantity squared. And then we do this over and over and over again, maybe n times, extracting over and over until the fraction that remains Q of our solute in water is equal to V1 over V1 plus K times V2 to the nth power. So as an example, let's suppose that you're analyzing some solute that you're trying to extract from water using toluene. That solute has an equilibrium constant equal to three between the two solvents. We're going to determine the solute fraction that remains in 100 milliliters of a water solution that's originally 0.01 molar concentration if we apply a 500 milliliter extraction with toluene just one time versus five 100 milliliter extractions with toluene. I'd like you to consider which one you think is going to be more efficient or if we'll have the same result from both. And then let's calculate what those results look like. For part A, we're extracting with toluene once. So the fraction that remains in water raised to the first power is equal to the volume of water that we use, 100 milliliters, divided by the volume of water, 100, plus our equilibrium constant times the volume of toluene that we've used, all raised to the first power. This is a fraction that simplifies as 1 16th. That's about 6%. So from one extraction, with 500 milliliters of toluene, we get about 6% of our solute remains in water after equilibrium's been established. But in part B, we're applying an extraction with toluene five times over, with less volume each time. But here, we're raising our power of Q to the fifth. We still have 100 milliliters of our water to start with. We still have an equilibrium constant of three, 
but this time our volume of toluene is 100, but we're going to raise all of this to the fifth power. This results in about 1 times 10 to the minus 3. That's 0.1%. We have far better efficiency when we use method B versus method A. So why is this second method so much more efficient at extracting our solute from water? We're using the same total volume of toluene, 500 milliliters. We're just doing it five times with small aliquots each time in part B. Oh, that's the key to this difference in efficiency. Method B had five different opportunities for an equilibrium to be established between our solute and water versus our solute and toluene. Whereas method A only had one opportunity for an equilibrium to be established. Historically, separations conducted like this through extractions were done in series of extractions, all stacked in these great configurated plates. As our original analyte moves from one plate to the next, a new equilibrium can be established. In method A of this example, we're reflecting the use of just one plate. But method B reflects the use of five plates. This concept that draws from historical use of stacks of plates to establish equilibria still finds use in terminology today. We refer to these equilibria as theoretical plates. According to modern plate theory, a plate is a hypothetical zone where an equilibrium may be established for an analyte that's apportioned between two different phases. Generally speaking, the more plates, the more equilibria that are established between two phases. And therefore, the better efficiency in separation. Modern separation techniques are designed to give the maximum number of equilibria points possible. In other words, they have a tremendous number of theoretical plates. The use of theoretical plates and the application of these individual points of equilibria can be summarized through analytical techniques known as chromatography. Chromatography is an extraction-like technique where one phase is held in place and another phase moves through or around it. We call the phase that's fixed in place a stationary phase. And we call the phase that moves through or around that stationary phase the mobile phase. A mobile phase can be gaseous, in which case we use gas chromatography, or liquid, in which case we can use various types of liquid chromatography, HPLC, ion exchange chromatography, size exclusion chromatography, field flow fractionation, among others. A stationary phase is generally either a polar or nonpolar solid. It may sometimes be liquid. We evaluate the quality of separation via chromatography by, for one thing, band separation. This is how spaced apart bands of different analytes are after separate. We want large separation. So we want one band that corresponds to one analyte to be physically separate by a large space from a separate band that contains a separate analyte. We can address band separation and the quality of chromatography via plate theory. In other words, how many opportunities did an analyte in a particular environment have to establish an equilibrium with the stationary phase of our experiment. A second means of evaluating the quality of our separation is band broadening. 
Band broadening refers to how wide an individual analyte's band is. And even if it is separated from another analyte, we still want an individual analyte's band to be as narrow as possible because we want all of our analyte separated from any others and we want it all in one small, nice, neat, succinct bundle. We can address band broadening by a concept called rate theory. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. First, let's start by discussing plate theory. To think about plate theory in the sense of chromatography, let's imagine introducing a mobile phase that might be a water aqueous mixture that contains an analyte that we'll call any old analyte A to a tube that's packed with stationary phase. We often call this tube a column. As this mobile phase with analyte dissolved in it moves through that stationary phase tube, analyte particles are interacting with and establishing equilibria with stationary phase. So our mobile phase particles are reaching an equilibrium with stationary phase. And we refer once more to the equilibrium here as the concentration of our analyte that's in the stationary phase divided by the concentration of our analyte that remains in our mobile phase. Because our analyte particles are interacting with the stationary phase, it stands to reason that the mobile phase itself will escape from our tube first. We refer to this escaping by the term elution. We say that our mobile phase elutes from the tube first. And if we were analyzing for things coming out of the opposite end of this tube, maybe we follow a time plot where we think about how much time it takes for particles to escape this tube and we get a signal every time something does escape. Over time, we expect to see something that looks like this. First, a mobile phase escaping, and then an analyte escaping. We refer to this little peak here as the time that it took our mobile phase to escape and to this peak here as the time that it took for our analyte to escape. We refer to this first time, or first peak, as the mobile phase elution time. This is also sometimes referred to as the dead time. And we refer to this quantity most often as TR rather than TA. This is an analyte's retention time in our tube or column. So we've sent our analyte and mobile phase through a tube of a particular length, and it took our mobile phase this much time to elute through that tube. It took our analyte a little bit longer. So on average, these two things, our mobile phase and our analyte, were traveling at different speeds through this tube or column. We can say that the average speed of our analyte, VA, is equal to whatever the length of our column are, divided by the retention time of our analyte in that column. And the average speed of our mobile phase is equal to the length of that column divided by the amount of time that our mobile phase spent in it, Tm. If we relate these two things together, the average speed of our analyte through this tube is equal to the average speed of our mobile phase through this tube multiplied by some fraction that fraction is the relative amount of number of moles of our analyte in the mobile phase compared to the total moles of our analyte. This is similar to the Q fraction that we had in our extraction section a few minutes ago.
the average speed of our analyte is equal to the average speed of our mobile phase multiplied by Q. That's the moles of our analyte in our mobile phase divided by the total number of moles of analyte. We can calculate the number of moles of our analyte in the mobile phase if we know the concentration of A in our mobile phase and we know the volume of our mobile phase. And we can get the total number of moles of our analyte if we know the concentration of our analyte in the mobile phase and the volume in our mobile phase. And we know the concentration of our analyte in the stationary phase and the volume of our stationary phase. So our numerator looks like this top value. Our denominator looks like this bottom value, the total number of moles of analyte. If we plug those things into the fraction up above, we end up with this equation. The average speed of our analyte down this tube is equal to the average speed of our mobile phase down this tube multiplied by this quantity here. To simplify the fraction on the right-hand side, I'm going to divide everything through by our concentration of A in the mobile phase multiplied by our volume of the mobile phase. And we end up with this equation. The fraction on the right-hand side simplifies to 1 over 1 plus the ratio of the concentration of our analyte in the stationary versus the mobile phase. And we've already seen that we can represent this quantity by the equilibrium constant k. That shows us the relationship between the quantity of analyte in a stationary phase versus the quantity of analyte in a mobile phase. The ratio of an analyte in one phase to a, a concentration in another phase. So we can replace that whole quantity by the equilibrium constant, k. Multiplied by the volume of our stationary phase over the volume of our mobile phase. So really the comparison of rates of travel of our analyte and our mobile phase through this tube depend only on the equilibrium constant for our analyte interacting with our mobile and stationary phases multiplied by the volume ratio of our stationary to our mobile phase. And because of this, we can refer to this whole quantity, k times the volume of our stationary phase divided by the volume of our mobile phase by a new term. We're going to call it lowercase k prime. And this lowercase k prime is what's called a retention factor or capacity factor for a chromatographic separation. This quantity, the retention factor, capacity factor, is the sole determining quantity in distinguishing between the speed of our analyte versus the speed of our mobile phase through this tube or column. Our equation simplifies to this. And if we substitute in expressions for our speed of analyte and speed of mobile phase, namely the length of our column divided by our retention time of our analyte, the length of our column divided by the dead time for our mobile phase, and then rearrange this equation to solve for our retention factor k prime, we'll get rid of the length of our column, and that really didn't have any impact whatsoever. Instead, the difference between the time that it takes our mobile phase versus the time that it takes our analyte to elute through this column is all based on the retention factor, k prime, for this column. Our final equation works out to look like this. Our retention factor, k prime, is equal to the retention time for our analyte minus the dead time for our mobile phase divided by the dead time for our mobile phase. We can use this new equation to do something like determine the capacity factor for a particular HPLC or chromatographic separation column. Suppose that our particular column that we're analyzing 
Elute's mobile phase after 0.75 minutes and an analyte that we're interested in in 4.5 minutes. The retention factor for that column and that analyte is 4.5 minus 0.75 divided by 0.75. That retention factor or capacity factor is five. By itself, this capacity factor for this particular analyte tells us something intrinsically about the equilibrium constant for that particular analyte's ability to interact with stationary phase versus mobile phase. But in practice, what we're really after with the chromatographic separation is to separate two analytes from each other. In this case, we need to think about assigning a capacity factor or retention factor for each individual analyte and comparing them iteratively. The comparison of the capacity factor for each individual analyte in a mixture of analytes is called the selectivity factor. which we also give a name of alpha to. This selectivity factor tells us about how well two different analytes, say analyte A versus analyte B from the same mobile phase, will separate from each other. If we try to separate analyte A and B from each other, we calculate a selectivity factor that tells us the ratio of the capacity factor for B to the capacity factor for analyte A. If we worked this out using the equation up above, what we'd find is that the selectivity factor is the retention time for analyte B minus the dead time of our mobile phase divided by the retention time for analyte A minus the dead time for our mobile phase. And what's more, and really the important takeaway from this is that if alpha is equal to one, that suggests to us that the retention time for analyte A and B is the same. TRB equals TRA. In other words, these two analytes elute at the same time and there's no separation of analytes. We would really like separation. So, as alpha approaches infinity, separation becomes more efficient. The bigger alpha gets, the better the separation is. The more completely we have separated analytes from each other. So how do we accomplish these separations in the first place? Well, like we alluded to a few moments ago, there are two general classes of chromatography that we can discuss, gas and liquid chromatography. In a gas chromatography experiment, the mobile phase, like its name suggests, is a gas. That gas is an inert gas like helium, argon, or nitrogen, the choice of which depends on the detector that we use for our experiment. The stationary phase is a packed silica column. So this is often a solid, could be a liquid, packed in a long column, a long tube, and situated in an oven that is excellently controlled. Gas chromatography is a good choice for analytes that vaporize below 300 degrees Celsius. Many organic molecules, and particularly organic solvents, have vaporization temperatures well below 300 degrees C. We need any detector at the end of this column to be stable, sensitive, have a high dynamic linear range, and offer quick response times because not only do we want to be able to identify analytes as soon as they come off this column through elution, we also want to be able to distinguish one analyte from another. It's not always possible to have that selectivity 
without a particularly large investment in a selective detector. So, sometimes we'll get away with just being able to tell that something has eluded from a column. We call these types of detectors that just tell us whether something is present non-selective, while detectors that give us some idea of selectivity, the identity of a substance that is eluding, selective detectors. Two examples of common non-selective detectors are thermal conductivity detectors, TCDs, and flame ionization detectors, FIDs. In a thermal conductivity detector, a warm analyte passes over a thin filament, and in so doing, registers conductivity in that filament. That conductivity is read as an electrical response, which is output through computer software to something like a graph that visually charts the elution of substances from a column. In a flame ionization detector, an analyte is ionized in a flame as it leaves or elutes from the column. Electrical responses are detected based upon this ionization. Two common examples of selective detectors that can help identify the chemical makeup of substances eluding from a column are FTIRs, meaning that as soon as a substance leaves a column, it immediately is analyzed via FTIR or a mass spectrometer. FTIR, remember, gives us an idea about structure. The mass spectrometer tells us about components of masses from which we can start to piece together an overall structure. Obviously, these are expensive pieces of standalone equipment on their own, and interfacing them to, to a chromatograph is an investment. Therefore, most of the time, simple machines take advantage of non-selective detectors. As far as factors within our control that affect gas chromatographic or GC separations, we can think about the influence of temperature. For one thing, in order to perform a GC separation, we need to have a volatilizable analyte. So within the temperature range that's applicable, we need our analyte to vaporize. And what's more, we know from our treatment of thermodynamics that changes in temperature affect equilibrium constants. And so changing temperature influences how particular analytes interact with the stationary phase. We can manipulate temperature to change how a particular stationary phase analyte interaction proceeds and thus affect the retention time of particular analytes as they move through a GC column. This idea also suggests that intermolecular forces, particularly those forces between the analyte and stationary phase, are important in deciding what the retention time for a particular analyte is. Generally speaking, the greater the strength of the intermolecular force between an analyte and stationary phase, the longer that analyte will stick around in that stationary phase, the longer it will take to elute, and therefore the higher its retention time will be. A common stationary phase is PDMS, or polydimethylsiloxane, which is a polymer that has repeating units that look like this. On and on we have a silicon atom with methyl groups attached to it, connected to an oxygen and alternating dimethyl siloxane groups. Overall, we expect that because this particular substance is largely nonpolar, that nonpolar solutes or analytes will have greater interactions with this particular stationary phase than will polar solutes or analytes. So if we were trying to separate, say, propanol and butane by interaction with PDMS stationary phase, which one do you expect would stick around longer? Which one of these two has the longer retention time? It should stand to reason that because butane is nonpolar, butane will interact to a higher degree with our nonpolar stationary phase. Propanol, by virtue of having this hydroxyl group 
on the right hand side is polar. And so we would expect it to elute first. However, a GC separation might not be the most efficient choice for separating propanol and butane. Butane's got a much lower boiling point, negative one degree Celsius, compared to propanol, 97 degrees Celsius. So an easier separation technique might be simple distillation. In liquid chromatography, we apply a similar theory to GC, but our mobile phase is liquid instead of vapor. The polarity of the particular liquid mobile phase depends on the polarity of the stationary phase that we choose. The stationary phase is always either a polar or a nonpolar solid packed in a column. When the stationary phase is polar, we refer to it as being the normal phase. When the stationary phase is nonpolar, we refer to it as reverse phase. In a normal phase column, the stationary phase is polar and the mobile phase is nonpolar because we don't want the mobile phase to hang around and interact with the stationary phase. We want it to jet right out. An example might be a column that's packed with silica, where our stationary phase is silica, SiO2, and we might use a mobile phase that's hexane. Hexane is a nonpolar organic solvent. The order of elution in a normal phase column from the quickest to the longest retention time looks like this. The most nonpolar things elute first. The most polar things elute last. Retention time increases as we go from nonpolar to polar. This is because like dissolves like, and polar substances like to interact with other polar substances and establish strong intermolecular forces of attraction with other polar substances. In fact, the forces of intermolecular attraction can be so strong that you might eventually need to transition your mobile phase away from nonpolar hexane to something that incorporates slightly higher degrees of polarity in order to get very polar solutes to elute. This might require a gradient or variable mobile phase. For example, you might switch your mobile phase from hexane at the start to something like isopropanol for the end. In a reverse phase column, the stationary phase is nonpolar. Here the mobile phase must be polar and the order of elution is the reverse from up above. So our most polar things this time will elute first. So most polar have the shortest retention time and the most nonpolar substances have the longest retention time because they interact most strongly with our stationary phase. So our retention times increase from most polar to most nonpolar. We don't always need to change our mobile phase gradient from something that's polar to something that's nonpolar, but when we do, we have to be careful not to dissolve our stationary phase by changing our mobile phase to something that's too nonpolar. Regardless of stationary phase, an LC separation will result in a chromatogram that looks like this one. Like a GC separation, we'll still expect our mobile phase to elute first, and we will expect the majority of our analyte particles to have a retention time that's given by the midpoint of a Gaussian distribution or a normal distribution. So like we talked about in our statistics chapter earlier, a Gaussian or normal distribution has some central average point. But deviations from that average are expected. 
on the right hand side, we expect all of the analyte particles that make up this right half of this Gaussian distribution to be representative of analyte particles that really liked spending time with our stationary phase. So these were analyte particles that liked our stationary phase particularly well. They spent a whole lot more time with the stationary phase than the average particle did. On the opposite side of this distribution, we expect to find analyte particles that spent a whole lot more time with the mobile phase than the average analyte particle did. So here are analytes that liked our mobile phase. This distribution is exaggerated for clarity's sake, but what we can say is that if we get a high disparity in analyte particles that like the mobile phase versus analyte particles that like a stationary phase compared to an average analyte particle, then we expect a broad distribution and a broad retention time peak in a chromatogram. The width of this distribution, remember that we can describe on the basis of the quantity sigma. This is the standard deviation, and squaring the standard deviation is variance. So sigma squared is the variance. It's the square of one standard deviation for our Gaussian distribution. In order to make this Gaussian distribution in the first place, analyte particles had to travel down some column that's got a length L. L is the length of the column that these analyte particles traversed. The longer a column, the more opportunity for an analyte particle to say interact with a stationary phase and bias this distribution towards this upper end. The ratio of these two things then, the width of this Gaussian peak that's estimated by sigma squared, the variance, compared to the length of the column, which gives our estimate of higher likelihood of interaction, is a quantity that we call h. This h quantity is plate height. In the auspices of plate theory, where in order to separate analyte particles from each other, we need to establish equilibria. A plate is that establishment of equilibrium. The degree of interaction is measured by plate height. This quantity H tells us how long or how likely an analyte is to deviate from an average particle. We want this plate height quantity, this theoretical concept of length of interaction, to be as small as possible. In a chromatographic experiment, we want this plate height to be minimized. In order to think about how we do that and how we consequently narrow this chromatographic peak to as small and sharp a peak as we possibly can, we need to relate this plate height to the number of theoretical plates in the first place. The number of theoretical plates are points for equilibria to be established, n, is equal to the length of a column divided by plate height. Here's one important equation. Again, n is the number of theoretical plates, or the number of points where equilibria can be established. So remember, a plate is just a theoretical place where equilibrium is established between an analyte particle and the stationary phase. L is the length of a column, and h is our theoretical plate's height. Again, an estimate of how long a particular analyte on average will interact with our stationary phase at a particular point. 
the number of theoretical plates, the number of equilibrium opportunities, is the ratio of the length of the column to this theoretical plate height. So which do you suppose that we'd like to control in order to maximize the efficiency of separation, maximize the number of theoretical plates? Do we want this value to be large or this value to be small? Well, if we increase the length of our column, then this results in very long retention times, which means that particles are just interacting in many, many locations over this great length of column. So it's probably not a good idea to increase the column length because ultimately that can still lead to peak broadening. Thus, our only recourse in maximizing the number of plates is to try to establish a set length of column and minimize plate height. With minimized plate height, we maximize our efficiency. Remember that our Gaussian curve from our discussion of statistics, like the one represented up above, can be estimated very closely within plus or minus two standard deviations of the mean in terms of its width. 96% of all of these data points are wrapped up in a width that's two standard deviations above or two standard deviations below the mean of our Gaussian distribution. So to a good approximation, the width of that Gaussian peak W is equal to 2 times our standard deviation times 2, or 4 sigma. In saying that we'd like to maximize the number of theoretical plates, or minimize plate height, ultimately what we're after is to make this width as small as possible. We would like the standard deviation to be really small for analytes that act on average, that interact with our stationary phase, and that interact with our mobile phase respectively. So in order to compare this peak width to plate theory, what I'm going to do is take that quantity 4 sigma from up above and square both sides. In other words, the square of the width would be equal to 16 times sigma squared. And we already know that sigma squared is our variance. So our variance, to a good approximation, is the width of our peak squared divided by 16. And where else do we see variance but up here in our equation that relates this concept of plate height. Wherever we see sigma squared, we can replace with w squared, our peak width, over 16 to give our plate height. Now wherever we see plate height. We can plug in W squared, our width of our Gaussian peak, divided by 16, divided by L. So if we do that for the equation here for a number of theoretical plates, we come up with this expression. The number of theoretical plates is L divided by not H, but W squared over 16 over L, or over 16 L. And simplifying that further, multiplying both top and bottom by 16L, we get 16L squared over W squared. This is our number of theoretical plates. Again, we want to maximize that number of theoretical plates and minimize our peak width for our chromatogram. We've already seen that the length of our column is related to the retention time for an analyte on our column. So to another good approximation, we can say that L is gauged by the retention time of our analyte, TR. However long it takes our analyte to traverse our column is a good means by which to gauge our column's length. So one final modification to this. Instead of L, we'll use the retention time of our analyte to express the number of peaks. 16 
times the retention time of our analyte squared divided by the width of our chromatogram's peak squared. This is a very common means by which to measure the number of theoretical plates. So in practice, we use this relationship to estimate the number of theoretical plates or the number of locations of chemical equilibrium established between analyte and stationary phase in our separation experiment. This can help us assess whether our analyte underwent sufficient quantity of equilibria in order to achieve efficient separation. So suppose you carry out an experiment where you analyze an analyte that's got a retention time of 407 seconds eluding from a 12.2 meter column where your chromatogram signal has a peak width of 13.5 seconds as measured at its base. We're going to determine the efficiency of this column separation for this analyte by determining the number and height of our theoretical plates. In order to determine the number of theoretical plates n, we multiply 16 by our retention time squared and divide by the width of a peak squared. We'll get just a quantity that's a count, 1.45 times 10 to the 4 plates. Therefore, we expect 1.45 times 10 to the 4, about 14,000 opportunities for equilibrium for the average analyte traveling through this column. Our plate height can be calculated by relating h to the length of our column divided by the number of theoretical plates. Remember earlier, we had an equation that told us n was equal to our length over our plate height. So I've just rearranged that equation here. We were told that the length of our column was 12.2 meters, and we've now determined that the number of theoretical plates is 1.45 times 10 to the 4. We should get a measurement in meters, or here I'll convert it to millimeters so that it's a more palatable number, 0.84 millimeters. This plate height is again a measure of the likelihood of our analyte being skewed from average, either interacting more with our stationary phase or less with our stationary phase. And we want this number to be as small as possible. Here it's quite small, 0.84 millimeters. Overall, this application of plate theory helps us describe how an analyte is separated from other substances in order to isolate it. In chromatographic practice, this occurs because an analyte interacts with a stationary phase as a mobile phase carries it through a physical space, like a column packed with solid material. In order to further elucidate how peaks broaden or get wider, we'd have to think about several mechanisms of action that independently increase the variance of a Gaussian peak or the sigma squared value. In other words, what are the fundamental physical and chemical phenomena that lead to a broad peak in the first place? There are four mechanisms that can describe how peaks broaden. These are inevitable consequences of the nature of the chemical and physical makeup of substances involved in these chromatographic experiments. The first is what's referred to as a multipath process. The multipath process refers to the tendency of some molecules to follow a straight line path, while others follow a more erratic path. Some particles will travel in a straight line down a column, while others will take their fancy time going all over the place before they get to the end of our column. This latter phenomenon is an example of eddy diffusion. We can limit eddy diffusion by using columns that have as few barriers to progress as possible. An example of an 
LC column that contains limited barriers to particle motion through the column is an open dubular column, one whose stationary phase is a simple film that coats an open-ended column. Another phenomenon that affects peak broadening is longitudinal diffusion. This is an inevitable consequence of some particles just being plane faster than others, and others being slow compared to the average. Over time, particles even of the same makeup spread out due to longitudinal diffusion. A third influencing factor is the concept of mobile phase mass transfer. Essentially, this suggests that analyte particles in the middle of our column could be shielded from interactions with a stationary phase just by sheer statistics. Analyte particles that are in the center of the column might not get their time to spend with the stationary phase at all, or might have very limited time to spend with the stationary phase simply because so many other analyte particles near the stationary phase have already interacted with it and are already taking up space. These types of particles are much more likely to elute off the column first because they've stayed with the mobile phase for most of their lives in this column. In a similar vein, stationary phase mass transfer refers to variations in the surface area of the stationary phase, giving rise to the propensity for analyte particles to be blocked from moving back into the mobile phase. For example, on a microscopic scale, if we think about our column surface as being this black line, this is our outer column. Well, inside, at a microscopic level, the stationary phase might look something jarring like this. Here's our stationary phase. An analyte particle that interacts with our stationary phase right down here could be swept up again by moving mobile phase very easily. Whereas an analyte particle that interacts with our stationary phase way in this little crevice over here can't quite as easily make it back to the mobile phase. So this particle up here lags behind and will come out or loot at a retention time that's longer than the average particle. If you explore chromatography concepts in greater detail or start to carry out experiments like these for yourselves, eventually you'll come to the point where you can summarize the effects of these four mechanisms of peak broadening in a single equation called the Van Diemter equation that tells us how each one of these relates to the broadening of a peak. But generally speaking, as a takeaway and final comment on this issue, we can say that open tubular columns, things that limit multipath processes, are suitable for gas chromatography, but not for HPLC. And that's because the effects of mass transfer in the liquid mobile phase are much longer lived and have much greater effect than in the gas phase. Thus, for HPLC, we have to make do with particle-packed columns. And we have to try to make these particles as small as possible for a given application. So a lot of engineering goes into making columns for LC liquid chromatography applications.